In this week's episode of Conversations with Anglicans, I had a chat with Janelle Duke. She is currently a researcher at the National Archives and has been at this position for the past 10 years. We chat about her love of history and we get to learn about the history of the Anglican Church in this diocese. So you won't want to miss this episode. So get your snacks, sit back and relax and enjoy. Good afternoon, Janelle. Thank you so very much for accepting my invitation to chat with me this afternoon. And good afternoon to you, Ayanna. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, I, I have religiously um, attended the lecture series that you were doing with the cathedral. So I was, you know, really impressed by your moderation skills and your, your knowledge of history. So I felt that I had to, had to have a chat with you because, uh, I mean, history is not really my forte. And I love how... <laughs> historians are just able to rattle off dates and reasons and so forth. So I, I'm just interested in having a chat. And I think that our chat is timely because um, this year we're celebrating the 100, 150th year um, as a diocese and then next year the cathedral celebrates 200 years. So I think, you know, talking about the diocese is, is timely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to find out a little bit about you. First. So if you could tell me about the parish that you're at and how Anglicanism has impacted you as an individual. All right, so I am from the parish of the Holy Trinity and we just call it the Trinity Cathedral. So I've gone to Trinity Cathedral since I was about eight years old. Before that, I went to the St. Jude's Parish, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't really remember much about that, but growing up with Nolly Clark, and getting that influence, you know, it got you in the mood to be and to learn more about Anglicanism to, because, you know, in his sermons, he would put in all of that history, all of that information. Right. As a child, getting all of that information, you are more interested in to just that ideology of what is Anglicanism. Mm -hmm. you know, so. Wow, that is fantastic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, because nobody ever really, like, takes on the history of the church when you're when you're listening to a sermon, right? So I guess that whole idea of history and like in history started from young, I guess. Yes, yeah, yeah. And believe it or not, it was really my grandmother who really she influenced. Yeah, well, she was more than a historian. She was a genealogist, uh -huh. archivist, librarian. You know, she would go in the newspapers, cut out a little piece of. I don't know what it is, a little article here and there. So she right. had that pinned up. So, you know, she had those and she'd tell you about the history of our family because originally we came from Barbados, well, according to her. So, you know, you get into that history mode from very, very, so that was my inspiration. Wow. You know, not many of us, we don't know where our family originated from. So I, I appreciate what your grandmother did. I guess she was, she was like the original like ancestry you know those databases yes. that they have yes. now she, she started that yes. <laughs> yeah, she was um, well i guess your your grandmother influenced your love of history um and how did this love of history uh dictate your studies and the profession that you entered well, well, well i don't know i don't know there was a choice between at least this is what i remember a choice between doing medicine and doing history and well, I guess that one out, the history one <laughs> yeah. out for some weird reason or the other. Because, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to get into medicine. And yes, I had the subjects, but I don't, know, I don't know. I thought I would have done it afterward. Well, I just fell into, everything just fell into place, I guess. So I guess so. I, yeah. So I just continued in this way. So what sort of studies did you do um, in history? Well, I did my bachelor's, master's in history, and then I branched over to archives now. Is, do you have mm -hmm. any specialty in history, any sort of era or... Well, church, church is basically the specialty. I look at, it's like, 18th century, so that was like 1800 to 1899, and then the early period of this, of 1900, so 1900 to, let's say, 1930s, 1940s. 
So that's what I look at really. I, I try to look for information around that time. But where would you find information like that um, about the church? It, it, where, would they be, where would that be located? Well, the church has a lot of their own information. Really? That is one, yeah. The church has a lot of its own information from baptisms, uh, marriages. Believe it or not, that is more historical than anything else. Um, Trinity Cathedral has the oldest set of records because obviously it was the first church. Right. But their records span from 1801, from the beginning of the church. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of information. But apart from the church itself, you could go to the archives, get more information. You could go to the National Library as well to get more information. And also UV Library. So you have a lot of information out there, Barbados, Jamaica. You just have to know where to look for it. Yeah. Ah, right. So we're going to jump into the history now, Janelle. We're going to jump into right. the history to find out about the shoes. <laughs> so one of the things that I wanted to find out, though, is before Anglicanism came to Trinidad and or Tobago, what exactly was the religious identity that we had? Mainly Catholic. Um, Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Mainly because, remember, 1498, I'm carrying it back in time, 1498, Christopher Columbus. So he said he found Trinidad, but there were other people living here. The first peoples were here, so they had their own religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. But the major religion after, let's say, 1592 was Roman Catholicism all the way to 1797. And, and pushing forward. And of course, still now, still have yeah. a lot of Roman Catholic influence. So yeah, so that was really our identity before that period. And then the Anglicans came to our show. And how did that how did that change up things on, on, on the island? Not much really, because the Roman Catholics owned the, the purse strings. They had the money. So they had the influence all the way to let's say the mid-1800s. They had all of that, all of that identity going along with them. But what had happened is that the Anglicans realized, hey, we need to do something so they started with anglicization right but that failed that that and all failed because people where they came from and of course they came from martinique they came from saint lucia they came from grenada and they came with their enslaved persons so of course they all followed the same beliefs so it was kind of hard for the british and for the americans to try to get into that mode but it did happen after a while for just a little bit, but of course, if you're speaking French, it's going to be hard for you to now learn English and to do things the British way. So that was always the contention during that 19th century period. So, yes. Okay, so the Anglicans had a, a bit of a struggle to, to make their market yeah, on the definitely. island. But then yeah. Sir Ralph Woodford decided to build the Trinity Church. So, so how did that how did that idea happen? What what was his role in Trinidad at the time for him to make that decision? Well, he became the governor in 1813, but in 1808, Port of Spain burned to the ground. So his one of his main duties coming at that time was to try to fix Port of Spain. Right. And one of the things that he decided to do was to build an Anglican church because, of course, he's British. So he's looking for that, that influence. And the church is that influence. But on the other hand, you had the Catholics, as we said before. And, of course, they had a church, but it was dilapidated. So now you have this argument. Are you going to build one for us? You're going to build one for your people. Are you building one for us? And then you have the crown. Telling, telling Woodford, no, you can't do that. That makes no sense. What you need to do is build one church and let everybody share it. But we know how that works. That is, that is going to make a war. You can't have, yeah. when are you going to have a service? When am I going to have services? Sunday morning? Sunday morning, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock? When, when? So to get away from that. And I believe that Woodford was a thinker before his time. It was way before his time, he was a young man, and he decided, no, I'm going to try to get some money here on the side, get some of the rich um, people in the society that were British and had British affiliation to help us build a church. 
And in that vein now, he's asking the Catholics now, could you all put some money and yes, I'll help you. You will get the same person to build it. And that person was one of the people working in his office. So if you go to do some history, you're gonna see that the same person that built, the, did the architecture, sorry, for Trinity Cathedral, he also did some of the architecture for Immaculate Conception. Oh. So that's how it started off, yeah? So of course, Trinity Cathedral finished 1819, way before the Catholics, they finished, I think, in the 1830s. But of course, you could see um, from the architecture how it looked. So they had a lot more to put together, a lot more money, a lot more resources to get the church. Because if you do some Roman Catholic history as well, you would see that they are a minor basilica. And if you see some of those basilicas around the world, you'll know what I'm talking about. Very, very intricate designs, very, very beautiful inside and out. So they had a lot to do. So it took them a longer while to get that done. So yeah, that was his influence, really. So that's why you see that if you go into the Catholic Church as well as Trinity Cathedral, the two cathedrals, you're going to see that both of them have a sculpture dedicated to Woodford. And that is why, because he really worked to get them on similar footing. Hmm? I mean, I don't want to say the Anglican Church has had money problems since time immemorial, you know, but I, well, I, don't, I, don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to go down that road with us. But um, is it, is it to me, I, I don't know if I'm remembering wrong, is did the first church, did that get burned down in the, the first church that he tried to build for, for the Anglican religion? Did that get burned in the fire or no? Yeah, yes. That one was on the corner of Prince and Frederick Streets. Right, and that so got that burned, Yeah. Just as how what is now is how um that's what we like to think happened, right? All of the buildings are close together now, but all are concrete. But in that time it was all wood. So right. one fire and one wrong breeze with a fire equals disaster. So that is what happened. Right. But I'm still trying to figure out then how the church has their records from 1801 if the fire took everything in 1808. So that's something for me to continue to research. Mm. I can't give you the answer for that, but it's right. very interesting to see we have complete records. Right, mm. that's excellent. Um, and then he tried to build a church in Brunswick Square, but there were objections to the church being built there. Yeah. Yes. Well, in that time, I don't want to say it's environmentalist, but how Port of Spain was shipped back then. The St. Anne's River used to pass through Brunswick Square, and people, of course, getting the vegetation, getting the water, would carry their animals to graze, to get water, and to probably get water to do their daily things, right? And the river was going out into the sea and shut on street. So the first idea that came to mind was yes, to put Trinity Cathedral there, but of course, you're going to interrupt people's lives if you do that. So that was the main objective generally until they got that other piece of land right? and then they diverted the St. Anne's River so that's what we call East Dry River today because it, it became a dry river down to the end but it is a very raging river if you go up into the hills and St. Anne's you know? so that is what is going on that's why they tell children if you're playing down there be very careful because you never know if rain is falling up in the mountains and that river it's going to rush down and it's going to take you before you even have time to run out. Yeah? So that is, yeah, so that's, that is what happened. That is what they thought made sense was now to move it to the other side, which, well, it wasn't Brunswick Square at that time. I think it had a different name. Brunswick Square came about later on and then it was changed to uh, Ford Square because um, the, the Germans and the British and blah, blah, blah. And, World War no, 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 what has happened? Crazy things, and it is one of the reasons that you have the Queen, her last name is Windsor, and right. not what was before, Saxon Gutter and something like that, and it was their last name. They were trying to get away from that um, German affiliation, so they changed the square to Woodford Square. And she changed her name from that to, I think, Saxon Thor 
or something. It, it was a very long in Saxburg and Coburg or something like that. And it changed over to the House of Windsor. So yeah, so that was the trying to get away from that German affiliation. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, so a lot um, <laughs> uh, um, so then of course that church became a cathedral, they got it got consecrated and so forth. And how did that now help? I don't know, grew the Anglican church? Did, did, did more people start to come to the church? What was happening then? Right. Well, I don't think so, you know. Um, because the British came so late to Trinidad, when the British was in, let's say, Jamaica since 1655 and in Barbados since 1640. Even in, even in Tobago from, we could say more or less 1763, so if you are coming in 1797, you have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. right. So that influence that you would see in other islands wasn't present. So the problem was that if you don't have the influence, it means that you don't have enough people. And enough right. people means you don't have enough subs in the church. Enough subs because you don't have enough money. So you see how it, it all works out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All, all works out. Wow. Now, one of the things that I've noticed, Chanel, is that the majority of the members of the Anglican Church of Angli of, are of African descent, right? You have a smattering of other ethnicities around, but, um, you know, it's mostly of African descent. Can, do you, have you ever tried to trace back why that is? Well, I never tried to do much anthropology, but I guess it's because it's the enslaved. And you could see that in the Catholic Church as well, that there are a lot of people of African descent, yes, you have what people call the one percenters. Ah, yes. It's the, I mean, it's the same thing. We have some one percenters as well. You may not see them all the time, but they are there. And a lot of white person, or it's not really white, we call them now. Mm -hmm. So it's really according to where you're going, it's the dynamic. And mm -hmm. yes, um, and the enslaved population may not be most of the population in most islands. And here in Trinidad, it wasn't any different. So that's why I guess you may see more people of African descent as Anglicans. And then Trinidad, too, is just like the US, where people were trying to get to a better life. So they would come in. So they already had their religious persuasion. A lot of people came from Barbados. Because I don't know if you know the story, uh, a lot of them came to be police and immigration officer. Police and immigration were one. So they would ask you, they see you, they saw you on the square. Let's say the promenade. You say, say box. And you say it the wrong way. We would say box. So you'd know that you're a trainee. But if I say box, that means that you you're not are not from here. <laughs> yeah, that is me from Guyana or something. Say box. And when they hear you say box, they pick you up. They say, say oil. But we would say oil. And some people would say oil. So say oil. If I can't. Wow. <laughs> Whoa. So, yeah. yeah, so a lot of people were coming from different islands as far as Jamaica. And you know, there are a lot of people coming from Venezuela ever since the beginning, not now. That is not something new. People were coming ever since the beginning. So, this is why you have so many people and so many different religious positions um, and so many people of African descent in the church, at least. When you work it out like that in your mind, it, it sounds good. That it sounds like it sounds plausible that that could be the reason. Yeah. But I know that the the Anglican Church as well would have provided education for um, some of the the children of the um, enslaved people. Um, but then the Catholics were offering that as well. So I, I, I you know, I'm trying to, to wonder, you know, because I know the Anglican Church has a very, um, shall I say, good reputation of providing good education. You know, I know that's one of the, the pluses of our of our church. So did that, do you think that could have a, an impact as well? Yes. And well, the schools came out of the same war I was talking about between the Anglicans and the Catholics. So the Catholics yeah. built a school. Yeah, in this spot, and if you look over the road on next door, you're going to see an African school right there. Ta -da! So that is what was happening. Uh, they were trying to, well, the government was trying to teach well, the African persons, uh, uh, anybody who came into the society, 
in a certain way. So they're trying to teach you agriculture. And people did not want to hear about that. Right. So they had your Catholic schools doing a lot of drama things. And at a point, well, you know, St. Joseph's Convent, one of the oldest schools in Trinidad, uh, they were more like a finishing school for students, for, for girls. So you, you finished off some of the things there and then you went back to France to get whatever it is. I, I really can't tell you, but it, as the finishing school goes, it's ready for you to be better and being a housewife and taking care of your husband. But we could see the difference with Bishop Anstey High School coming yeah. in, in the old 1900s, 1921. Definitely wasn't that it was a crazy idea to bring black and colored girls. Into, why would you send these girls to school? That makes no sense. But well, I guess Arthur Henry Anstey had his ideas, his own ideas. So bringing these girls, not for finishing school, but to learn sciences, to learn arts. Well, you see how that has paid off in this society. So yeah, um, the Anglican Church has had a, a good, good, how you, how you say, commitment to education since the beginning. And they realize that, yeah, people don't want to learn about agriculture. We are getting away from that, from the estate, from the plantation society. So you need to give us something different. So I think the church is, in that way is still going forward, teaching, teaching students how to well, live, what you can do, and then trying to get them into Anglicanism. Well, I guess it's a lesser state, but it's still there. So yeah, our commitment to education has gone far. And it yeah. is still going. Yeah, they, Bishop Ansi really must be commended for, for being brave in that time to make mm -hmm. that decision to, to say, you know, he was opening a, a school for a, a, a certain sector of society, you know, so we are grateful for his uh, his courage and his bravery, you know. Um, I wanted to find out though, is it the Anglican Church, so while we're grateful for the, the impact that the Anglican Church had on education and so forth, I mean, the Anglican Church, did, did the Anglican Church play a role in the enslavement of people? Did they, what did they do? Did they try to rally for the emancipation? Of enslaved people? Right. So, how should I answer that? That's a real loaded question. And I'll tell you <laughs> oh, <why>. boy. <laughs> yes, they were complicit in slavery, but it's because church and state won. So, church made up an institution of the state, just like the immigration division or registrar general. It was part of the state, so they had to do what they had to do. And a lot of people that, well, a lot of the songs that we know today were people who had enslaved persons and they still had the divinity God was speaking to them and they wrote their songs. So one of the things that I dislike the most, uh, Amazing Grace is one of those. Yeah, so it speaks to you. And if you think about it in that vein as a slave or an excellent slave or a child of someone who was enslaved at some point, because if you think about it, uh, slavery wasn't that long ago. Hmm. That was about a hundred years plus. Yeah. So it wasn't that long ago as, as you may think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as I said, it's a very, very loaded, <laughs> a loaded question because you had, a, you had priests, you had people of influence in the society, they had their divinity, but yet still the enslaved persons because they needed somebody to work and they weren't going to work. They're not the people to work. So they had to get somebody. So yes, church was complicit. In some veins, yes, they tried to fight against enslavement, but only for the good of money, really, because it was cheaper to have indentured workers. And I'm not only thinking about indentured Indians now. Anybody else that, instead of beating them to that, it was cheaper to just pay them a minimal wage and get your work done. Yeah? Because we tend people to that people, uh, they're not going to be very happy about working for you. Mm -hmm. And they will try as much as possible to rebel. People rebel. Yeah. So don't, you can't take it at face value that people are just going to say, yes, beat me. Yes, I, I like this. Go ahead. Oppress me. Yeah. They're going to try some way to fight that. Exactly. So, yeah. 
the church was part of the thing, part of the frame. And I don't know, there are a lot, there's much more to look for, a lot more to research where the church is involved. But I guess we had to wait for some other historians going on to do some more research to see what, what more we could look at, what more we could see. Right. Um, the slave altar in the cathedral. I, I I look at it sometimes and and you know I'm like you know it 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 was built specifically for slaves to be in the service while their what while their owners were were in the service. What what was that water for? Yeah. Sorry, that's what I was supposed wow. to say. I, well, if you look back, I was looking at some, for some, some odd reason or the other, I was looking at some newspapers and it was showing you the opening of Trinity Cathedral in 1823. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't only the enslaved that was at the back of the church. Now, think about how the church is built, right? Mm-hmm. So you're thinking about on this side, on one side, you have the front and you have the other side of the front, you mm-hmm. have the organ. Right, uh, straight ahead of you, and then you have a cross aisle, yeah. you have the western door to the front of you, and then you have two sets of pews again on yeah. either side. Then you have the enslaved the altar at the back, right? So, every one of those were rented for different price. So, according to how far your money could roll, then then you would have a seat there. Oh. It wasn't until the, the mid 70s that that had stopped and that was in every church. So you couldn't go and sit where I'm supposed to be sitting. People are gonna tell you, oh no, that's a gypsy pew right there, you know. You can't sit there because they're paying for that. Whether you were there or not that Sunday, you can't just go and sit there, right? So you have now, yes, the slave altar and you have the people up front doing what they do, praising their God but you're still trying to evangelize at the end. You know? So that's why you have, and remember these people were not only persons um, cutting things in the field. You had nannies, you had the person um, pushing your cart, everything, right? Your driver, that's what I'm trying to put. Your driver, so your, your driver for your carriage. So those are the people that would be sitting down in the market. You can't have them sitting outside waiting for you idling. You don't know what they're doing. So you have to put them in the back there and say, you know, the right hand must always know what the left hand is about. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. it's a performer control also. Yeah. Right. Basically, I'm trying to say. Performer so what control. You, what do you mean rent? What do you mean paying a price? Like, like for, the, for a I few, mean, I mean, they're coming to church. Like you, rent, you rent an apartment. <laughs> Just like how you rent an apartment is the same way. You rent a few? Yes, you rent a few. Wow! If you pay subs, it, it said that you paid subs, I think, um, every quarter. So, wow. And according to where you sit, it's a different fee. As I said, it's a nominal fee or more expensive fee. So, of course, the, the further up you are, the more yeah. expensive. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. This is a you see about ch- that in church, I think that 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 kind of just blew my mind. <laughs> right, now. Catholic church as well, and all. It's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine, but it's just you know that idea of, you know, you're you're more deserving of a front seat because you because of your status. You know how far you know. stretch. Yeah. Sorry, what you said? Sorry. I know how far your money can stretch. So. You know, and if I'm the mayor of the school, I don't want to be sitting next to you who working in the fish market. No, of course not. Hmm. Wow. That is really, really interesting. That's interesting. What about the um the, the, the part on top, the, the pews on No, that was the choir. That was supposed to be for choir. Oh, okay. All right. That was pretty quiet. Okay, cool. Wow. <laughs> 